Thank you. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to be speaking here uh, to the friends of, of Imperial College. And, um, and yes, so um, my talk is, is about Higgs cosmology, which is my own uh, research area. So I do research in particle physics and cosmology, and in particular focusing on now the uh, cosmological implications of the, of the Higgs boson and the Higgs field. Okay. And so this is about the, the Higgs boson. I would imagine that many of you are familiar with the discovery of the Higgs boson eight years ago at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider. Two experiments, CMS and ATLAS, found this new particle called the Higgs boson, which um, made, a, made big headlines. It was um, in the Guardian, they said that it changes the way we see the universe forever. Some people like to call it the God particle. And so what I want to talk about in this talk is, is, is precisely so what it is and how it changes the way we see the universe. And especially now, eight years later, um, so based on what we have learned from it, how has it actually changed uh, the way we see the universe? And um, so the Higgs boson is part of the standard model of particle physics. And that's the name for our current theoretical understanding of elementary particles and their interactions. And um, it's a theory which describes different types of elementary particles. So we've got matter particles, two types of matter particles, leptons and quarks. Leptons are particles like the electron and quarks are the particles which are, which are inside the nucleus of the of the atom. And so they make up uh, uh, protons and neutrons. And uh, both quarks and leptons uh, come in um, in six different types. And we also have particles that carry forces. There's photon, which uh, carries the electromagnetic force. W and Z bosons carry the uh, weak nuclear force, and that's the that's the nuclear force that's responsible for radioactive decays and also the nuclear reactions that uh, power the sun or the power or nuclear power stations. And then we have gluons, which are um, the carriers of the strong uh, nuclear force. And that is the force that binds the quarks together into protons or, or neutrons. There's obviously also one more force, which I haven't included here, and that is gravity. Gravity is not part of the standard model um, because we don't really understand yet how to integrate it um, with the others. We don't have a full quantum theory of gravity yet. And so that's why it's not part of this picture yet. Hopefully one day it will be. But anyway, so in the standard model, we have matter particles, we have force carriers, and then we have one more particle, and that is uh, the, the Higgs boson, which we have here in the center of the theory. And that's because it's, it actually plays a very central role. It's neither matter nor a force carrier. It's something else and something much more important. And, um, and often it's, uh, its role is explained, like Brian Cox here, uh, saying that it gives mass to particles. And that certainly is true. It gives mass to, um, to the leptons and quarks, and it gives mass to W and Z bosons. But um, it actually does a lot more than that. And in many ways, its, it's actual role is to bind everything together. It's, it's, the, it's the glue that allows um, the different types of um, different types of particles to fit together theoretically. So um, it is, it's actually a much more, has a much more central role than just giving the mass, even though it, it certainly does that. And to understand its role, um, it's useful to, to be aware of, of what's the sort of basis of the standard model is. And it, it's all based on the ideas some certain ideas of symmetry. Now, 
symmetries are obviously something which is which appear in art and in nature in many places um, here are just some some examples so today we are familiar with the concepts um, in everyday lives but in in particle physics we've actually learned that they are um, a very powerful way of of understanding understanding the theoretical structure of uh, of of our ele elementary particles and how they behave and in fact symmetries seem to be responsible for the for the interactions of of particles so in the standard model all the force carriers the electromagnetic force the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force they are actually consequences of symmetries symmetries we call gate symmetries I won't go to the detail of that, but it's it's just important as a background to understand that uh, this idea of symmetry is more than just an aesthetic thing. It actually, as far as we understand, it is what determines uh, the the way uh, particles uh, interact, at the elementary particles interact uh, at the fundamental level. And in the standard model, we have a number of these symmetries, and one of them which is the most important one for this story is called weak isospin and it's the symmetry that is responsible for the weak nuclear force and to some extent also uh, for for electromagnetism and it, you can think of it as a symmetry that um, that relates electrons and neutrinos and the theory actually has a symmetry between them and in some sense at the theoretical level electrons and neutrinos are identical and similarly at the theoretical level electromagnetism and weak nuclear force in some sense there's a symmetry between them and they are at the theoretical level they appear in an identical way and that's what the symmetry is there's a symmetry between them and that that symmetry was um, first postulated and um, and uh, uh, proposed by Sheldon Glashow in early early 1960s, but but clearly it doesn't quite work. It it gives in many ways the correct description of the weak nuclear force, but we know that there isn't actually a symmetry between electrons and neutrinos, and the weak nuclear force isn't identical to electromagnetism. So. So therefore, that symmetry, even though theoretically it seems to be there and it uh, it describes many of the of the observations, it quite clearly isn't there. We know that electrons have an electric charge, neutrinos don't. Electrons have a mass, neutrinos don't. So they are not symmetric. They are not identical. There's no symmetry between them. And um, Peter Higgs and later Tom Kibble here at Imperial realized how to solve this problem, um, this contradiction. And that is um, by introducing a field, which is now known as the Higgs field. And that is a special kind of field. It's a scalar field, which means that it's neither matter nor a force carrier. And scalar field is a field which looks just like empty space in many ways. If you just have a uniform scalar field, you would not be able to tell that it's there. It just looks like empty vacuum, empty space, except that it interacts with, with all the particles. And through that interaction, it changes their properties. So the scalar field therefore um, solves this puzzle. And the way, um, the way Peter Higgs um, solved it, was by assuming that uh, the scalar field has this kind of a Mexican hat shape potential. And what we mean by potential is essentially that's the space, that's the landscape in which the scalar field lives. And just like in a, in a um, normal landscape, if you have a ball, it, it tries to, um, it wants to roll to the minimum of, of, the, of the potential. It, rolls down the hill and the scalar field 
wants to do the same thing. It wants to go to the minimum of the potential. But Peter Higgs postulated that the potential for the scalar field actually has this shape, a Mexican hat shape, which you can see has a symmetry. If you, you, can, you can rotate it and it looks the same, so it's symmetric. But the minimum of the, of the potential is not symmetric, because uh, the symmetric point is here, is, is here at the top. But the minimum, there's a whole circle of minima here. And because, this, because the scalar field, the Higgs field, wants to be in the minimum, the actual vacuum state, the ground state of our theory, is not where the scalar field is at the top, but it is where it's at the bottom here. And there is a whole circle of different points where it could be, but it doesn't matter where it is because they are all identical. But what matters is that none of them are symmetric. So whichever value, whichever direction it chooses, that breaks the symmetry. So we say the symmetry is broken. The theory itself is symmetric, but the state of the system is not. And it's the direction that the Higgs field chooses, arbitrary random direction. It, it's that direction that we then experience as electromagnetic, and the perpendicular direction is what we experience as the nuclear force. And it's the correspondingly, it's the direction where the Higgs field is, which um, is the electrically charged particle, the electron, and the perpendicular direction is the neutral particle, uh, the neutrino. And when you add this field, which breaks this symmetry into the theory, everything fits. And that was, uh, that was the discovery of, um, or that was the theoretical idea of Peter Higgs, which was then turned into a complete theory of particle physics by um, Weinberg and Salam later. And that became the basis of the standard model of particle physics. And because this is um, Friends of Imperial College, I just wanted to highlight the role that Imperial College played in this. So the key players in this story were Peter Higgs, who came up with the original idea, uh, Tom Kibol, who, um, who turned that idea, developed that idea further so that it could be applied to particle physics. And then Salam and Weinberg, who wrote down the actual theory of, of, of electroweak interactions, which is the basis of the standard model. And as you can see, they all worked at Imperial College at the crucial times of this. Peter Higgs had moved to Edinburgh when, when he actually wrote his, his paper where he postulated this theory. And Weinberg was only visiting Imperial but they all worked at Imperial College. So Imperial really was the place where a lot of this happened uh, 60 years ago. Okay, so you could then ask, uh, well, so what? So the discovery of the Higgs meant that um, we found the last, we found this particle that was predicted, everything fits, it confirmed the theory. But have you actually learned anything more? Or was it just a confirmation of what we already knew? And in some sense, at first, at the superficial level, it might seem that it was. Because at the time, um, before uh, 2012, there was a lot of hope that the, um, the, that the Large Hadron Collider would discover all kinds of interesting new things. Um, people talked a lot about supersymmetry large extra dimensions, lots of other things that might, might be there. And we haven't actually seen any of that. And um, the reason why people were very confident uh, that those, uh, those things would be found was that uh, the theory seemed to point into that direction. And um, it's summarized, or it's sort of illustrated by this plot I have here, which um, takes the theory, the standard model, 
which of course we have only been able to test at energies that are accessible uh, with particle accelerators, but which we can then as we, we can then try to see what what the theory predicts about higher energies. In principle, you can take the theory and calculate what happens at a lot higher energies. And um, this plot here shows how the interaction strengths of the Higgs boson, just one of the quantities that you could look at, but, uh, but an interesting one, how, that, uh, how the theory predicts that it changes with energy if you go to higher energy. So this is at the bottom of the scale is what we can actually study with uh, experiments today. If you go to very high energies here, we know that the theory won't work anymore because we know that there must be quantum gravity and that it becomes important up here. But in between, we shouldn't need quantum gravity and there could be all kinds of interesting things happening. And if you take the standard model and calculate what happens at these higher energies, that turns out to depend on very much, very sensitively on the mass of the Higgs boson. If it's if it was, for example, 100 giga electron volts, then you would, then the theory would predict that very soon when you start to go higher energies, the interaction strength changes from positive to negative, which means that the interaction with the low energies where we can do the experiments is repulsive. Higgs bosons repel each other, becomes attractive here, and at higher energies, the theory would predict that it's attractive. And that for a scalar field is a problem because it means that the scalar particles tend to congregate together and start a chain reaction, which, which would lead to what we call vacuum instability and vacuum decay. That theory would not be realistic. Similarly, if the Higgs mass was 200 GeV or higher, we would find that the interaction strength starts to increase very rapidly and actually goes to infinity at some uh, energy scale, which is well below the, the scale of quantum gravity. And that means that the theory can't, can't work. It, it, it breaks down, as we say. And both of those predictions what they really mean is just that the theory that we have exceeded the range of validity of the theory and that there must be some new physics uh, that enters and changes the behavior in the same way as when we use um, classical mechanics. It only has, um, has some uh, finite range of validity and if you go beyond it, we need something new. And so based on this argument here, it was thought that there needs to be that the theory isn't consistent at high energies and there needs to be some new physics supersymmetry or something else and uh, everyone was hoping that we would find it with a large hadron collider however the higgs was found and its mass was 125 giga electron volts which is actually right in the middle it's a mass where everything remains fine all the way up to the scale of quantum gravity. It's a very special mass. There's a narrow range of masses for which uh, the theory actually can work and make sense all the way to the energy scale of quantum gravity. And that means that at that mass, there's no theoretical reason uh, to have any new physics. The standard model, together with whatever the correct theory of quantum gravity is, would be a perfectly consistent theory on its own. It doesn't require any new physics. Of course, empirically, we may find evidence for new physics, but theoretically, it remains a consistent theory all the way up to the scale of quantum gravity. And that is a very interesting result. It, maybe it's a hint, maybe it tells us something about the fundamental uh, physics, and there are lots of lots of work going on trying to understand uh, that link. Can we actually um, connect this way, the standard model, with uh, quantum gravity? 
But uh, my perspective here is to note that if this is true, it means that we can actually apply the standard model to the early universe where energies are very high. In the early universe, we need uh, to reach this kind of energies, which we thought 10 years ago that are not accessible with the standard model. That would require supersymmetry or some other new physics, whatever that is, before we can really uh, say anything definite about those energies. But now we can actually make the minimal assumption that there isn't anything else. The standard model is all there is, and ask what it tells us about the early universe. And that is what I mean by Higgs cosmology. So it's taking the standard model, the minimal theory, just the standard model, and see what it predicts. And then compare that with observations to see if there is in the cosmological observations any new hints about any new physics that um, that might be needed. And I call it Higgs cosmology rather than the uh, rather than standard model cosmology because it turns out that the Higgs field is in many ways the most important, the most interesting part of the standard model. So it plays a plays a central role in many different phenomena in the early universe and can potentially answer many of the big puzzles we have about the universe. So I've got here a list of four that I will, I will uh, briefly uh, mention in this talk. Um, inflation. We believe that uh, there's a strong, there's a lot of evidence that um, in the very early stages, the universe underwent a period of accelerating expansion called inflation, but we don't know what caused it. So that's the first big question. What, why, why did the universe accelerate? The second is the origin of matter, ordinary matter, atoms. Where did it come from? Where did all the matter we are made of come from? Again, actually the Higgs field plays a central role in answering that. Nature of dark matter, most of the matter in the universe is not made of atoms. It's some kind of dark matter. And the Higgs field may tell us something about that as well. And then I will finish by saying what the Higgs field will or may, may tell us about the end of the universe. So let us start with inflation. Um, so here is just a, a brief timeline of the history of the universe as we know it. Um, and it's, uh, so the axis here is time, it's logarithmic, so therefore it magnifies the very early times. And the first period that we have any evidence of um, in the history of the universe was inflation. And that's when the, when the, when the universe was expanding at an accelerating rate. That's in some sense, from our perspective, that's what started the expansion of the universe. So that's what we would, that's really when we talk about the Big Bang. That's what we, that's what we, uh, that's what we mean. And um, that originally the idea that there was this accel period of acceleration, it was proposed by Alan Goose in 1981 as a way of explaining why the universe is so large and so flat. In, it doesn't have a spatial curvature. And um, it consists of, um, of, of, of the way Goose um, explained this acceleration was by uh, postulating a scalar field called the inflaton, which is an unknown field. We don't know what it is, but it, it drives uh, the acceleration. It, gives rise to a repulsive force in some sense, which makes the universe um, expand at an accelerating rate. That's what we call inflation. But interestingly, very soon after Goose had proposed it, it was realized that actually, if you have this kind of an accelerating period, it does a lot more. It does not only make the universe large and flat, but it also, the, um, 
the quantum fluctuations of this inflaton field get amplified by this expansion and they give rise to what we call curvature perturbations, ripples in the very early universe, which would later turn into structure. All of the structure in the universe originates, and by structure I mean galaxies, clusters of galaxies, all of that originates in these quantum fluctuations of this inflaton field. And we know that that works very well because not only can we observe the structures and measure their properties and compare them with the theory, but also those ripples are directly observable in the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is thermal radiation coming from the Big Bang, which we can, which we can see in the sky coming from all directions in the sky. And that has been measured with a slightly different temperature in different directions. And this curve here, uh, the data points here are measurements of, uh, of the anisotropy, the statistical um, fluctuations of the temperature in different directions. The data points are the measurements and this curve, this light blue curve here, is the theoretical prediction from inflation. And they match incredibly well. So that's really why we, why we are convinced that, that there really was this period of inflation. And then the puzzle is what is this, well, what was this inflaton field? What was this scalar field? And um, in 2007, so before the Higgs boson was, uh, was uh, discovered in experiments, um, two Russian physicists, Veshukov and Saposnikov, postulated that it was actually the Higgs field. It had, a, I mean, that idea obviously, both are scalar fields, it sort of feels, seems natural to try, but it needs two very special things uh, to work. First of all, the mass of the Higgs boson has to be between 130 and 200 GeV. It has to be in this very narrow range for it to work. And um, of course, now we know experimentally that it actually is very, very close to, the, close to this range. But at the time, it was not known. The other thing it requires is very strong gravitational coupling. And that's something which is special uh, to the Higgs field in the standard model. So both matter particles and force carriers behave in a gravitational field. They just behave in the way we normally think particles would behave. But the, but the scalar field is different. And that's why it can give rise to inflation in the first place. Um, a scalar field, the behavior of a scalar field in a gravitational field is actually not uniquely determined by the theory. There's a parameter that um, needs to be measured, uh, which tells how, how strong the coupling between the Higgs field, the Higgs boson and gravity is. And we haven't measured that yet, because it's very difficult to measure that in experiments. The reason is that the Higgs bosons at Large Hadron Collider, they exist for a very short period of time. And also the gravitational fields are extremely weak on Earth. And so therefore, we don't know how strong this coupling is. So currently, we don't know how the, how the Higgs boson interacts with gravity. And for Higgs inflation, for Beshukov and Shaposnikov's theory to work, this coupling needs to be very strong, much stronger than most people would, would expect. And that's what, that's what, uh, what is needed for, for the theory to work. However, if you are willing to assume that, if you, if you assume that the Higgs mass is in that range and the coupling, gravitational coupling is as strong as is needed, then it actually works incredibly well. So here is a plot of observations, and these are just two parameters uh, that two of the most important things that uh, the cosmic microwave background uh, observations, experiments have measured, density to scalar ratio and the tilt of the spectrum. 
and um, the colored areas show what values are, uh, are compatible with observations. Um, typical simple theories of inflation would be somewhere here in the white region, which is excluded by observations. Simplest theories of inflation don't work. But Higgs inflation actually predicts this value here, which is right in the middle. It's perfectly compatible with observations. So Higgs inflation actually is both minimal because it doesn't need any new inflaton particle, but also uh, agrees perfectly with uh, experiments. It is, however, something which is uh, still a subject of huge amount of theoretical research because we don't really understand how to deal with this very strong gravitational coupling that is needed here. And therefore, we don't know if we can trust our calculations. So this is not, um, therefore, uh, uh, the story is not complete. We don't know if this theory actually is consistent. But at the level where we can do the calculations, it seems to work very well. So this is in many ways the simplest explanation for inflation. Okay, um, the second thing is the origin of matter uh, and ordinary matter in the universe. And um, the, the problem here is, uh, the reason why that's, uh, that's a problem is that um, we know very well from experiments and theory that all particles, all elementary particles have an antiparticle, which is um, a particle with the opposite electric charge. And um, if you have, if the particle meets its antiparticle, they annihilate each other. They just destroy each other and turn into just radiation. Electrons antiparticle is positron. Proton has an antiparticle, antiproton. And you can even make antihydrogen if you have antiproton and, and a positron. And this has been done, so this can be produced in experiments, and uh, physicists have even managed to make antihydrogen. So this is all very well known that uh, these exist. And that when they come in contact with the, when the particle comes in contact with the antiparticle, they destroy each other. All reactions, all particle physics processes that have ever been seen in experiments always produce the same number of particles and antiparticles or destroy the same number of particles and antiparticles. But then, where is, if that is the case, and then at the end of inflation, the universe was was empty, there was no matter. If this is true, if this was true in the early universe, then we should have, should have the same amount of matter and antimatter have uh, produced in the early universe. So where is all that antimatter? We don't see it. We don't have any evidence of the existence of antimatter anywhere in the observable universe, except very small uh, number of particles um, which are produced by astrophysical processes. So somehow the universe only seems to have matter in it. We are all made of matter. Uh, not, there's no antimatter in us. So how did this asymmetry uh, between matter and antimatter arise if the uh, laws of particle physics are symmetric and initially there was no antimatter? Initially, there was no matter or antimatter. So where is all the antimatter? Now, um, the first person who was really looking at this in detail was Andrei Saharov, who's actually a theoretical physicist, but who's actually more, uh, was better known as a, as a Soviet dissident and a human rights activist. Um, and he identified the three conditions that the theory has to satisfy in order to be able to explain the origin of matter. And it needs baryon number violation, which is just a process that produces a different number of protons than um, antiprotons. That's obvious that you must have that. You also need C and CP violation, which really just means that protons and antiprotons can't be perfect mirror images of each other. There must be some difference between those. 
because otherwise you would, even if there are uh, processes that um, produce different numbers of them, on average, you would pro still produce the same number if they have identical properties. And the third one is you need deviation from equilibrium, because if you are in equilibrium, then you never produce any particles at all, and therefore the universe would be empty. And um, in the standard model, it actually turns out that there are baryon number violating processes, and they are to do with the Higgs field. Um, there's a process called the Svaleron process, which is um, which is the following. So you can, this is the same potential we saw before. And in some sense, you can think of the baryon as being a string which is wrapped around uh, the minimum um, in this way. And to produce or destroy baryons, you need to get rid of this uh, string that's going around like this. This is wrapped around uh, uh, this potential. And the way you can do that is very simply by moving it over the top. And that's what very roughly what we call uh, Svaleron. And um, that's possible, but it needs a lot of energy because you have to move uh, the, uh, the string all the way to the top. And that's why these processes don't happen naturally. You need a lot of energy for that. There's another process known as the instanton process, which is a quantum mechanical tunneling process, where in some sense the string just goes through the barrier and that way un unwinds itself. That's very rare because the barrier is, the central bump here is so high that quantum tunneling through it is very rare and very slow. And this is, the reason for that is that the Higgs has such a heavy mass, because this is the Higgs potential, this is the potential of the Higgs field. And so in some sense, actually in the standard model, the only reason why baryon number seems to be conserved, why um, matter and antimatter can't turn into each other is the Higgs field. That's what prevents processes that um, change the number of particles versus antiparticles. If there was no Higgs field, that kind of processes would happen all the time and a proton would decay into leptons in an instant. The only reason proton has such a long lifetime is the Higgs field. And in the early universe, I'm going back to this uh, picture, um, temperature was very high, a very high number of kelvins here. And that means that um, you have lots of energy available. The Higgs field was able to jump over this barrier um, as it wished. And that's why baryon number was not conserved. The number of particles versus antiparticles was not conserved in the early universe. And that's why particles could be destroyed and created. A matter particles could be destroyed and created. So therefore condition one is satisfied, was satisfied in the early universe. C and CP violation, actually experimental, we know that that's how that happens. Particles and antiparticles are almost identical, but not exactly. So that's already in the standard model. And then finally, um, deviation from equilibrium. When temperature of the universe cooled down, there was a phase transition where the Higgs field became uh, non-zero. In the same way as there's a phase transition when you decrease the temperature of, let's say, water, it freezes. In the same way, the Higgs field, when you change the temperature, um, when it goes below 10 to the 15 Kelvin here, um, there's a phase transition, which um, actually, depending on your parameters, can be a very violent thing. So here is a simulation by my former student, David Weir, who is now an assistant professor at the University of Helsinki in Finland. And this shows, uh, this simulates how the Higgs field behaves in this transition. 
and it's very much like boiling water. It's very uh, violent bubbling um, uh, transition. And that gives you the deviation from equilibrium that you needed to explain uh, matter antimatter asymmetry. So therefore, the Higgs field in the early universe actually satisfies all of these conditions. And we have all the ingredients needed uh, to explain the matter, the, the origin of matter. Interestingly, though, if you really do the calculation and check whether it works, you find that it only works if the Higgs mass is less than 80 GeV, because otherwise you don't get violent enough phase transition, you don't get enough of these bubbles. And that doesn't quite work because the, uh, the mass that um, we measured in the experiments was 125 giga electron volts. So something doesn't quite match and so that's perhaps a hint of some new physics it is needed in order to explain um, explain the origin of matter. It seems very likely or at least plausible that um, that new physics could be neutrinos and um, therefore neutrino physics is very uh, much an important area uh, for this question. It could be that the answer just lies in, in um, properties of neutrinos, which we don't really fully know and understand. Okay, um, that was the second point. And then we get um, the third one, which is um, dark matter. And um, dark matter is, um, we know from astro astronomical observations that it seems that only very small part of the matter in the universe is actually visible uh, matter made of atoms. 84 or 85% of all matter in the universe is something else, not made of atoms and not visible. There's lots of astronomical evidence for that in many different shapes, but perhaps the most concrete is this here. Um, by um, this is um, two different observations of a, of the bullet cluster. That's a cluster of galaxies. Um, well, actually, it's the two clusters which, uh, in the past, sometime in the past, have uh, flown through each other and collided. And what these two uh, different observations show is here on the right. This is X-ray image, which shows that the um, ordinary matter is located here in the center, because that's where you get uh, most of the X-rays from. And that's natural if you have two balls of uh, matter um, colliding with each other. We imagine that they would hit each other because they interact, matter interacts. And that seems to have happened there. But here on the left, we can see how the mass of the two clusters is distributed. And it's actually not concentrated here in the center where we have the X-rays coming from. But there are two concentrations of mass here further away. So it seems that actually the mass has not collided. Most of the mass has just flown through without any kind of interaction. And that's uh, that would be the dark matter, which does not interact, and that's why it's dark. So here, this is the most concrete evidence, but there's a lot of evidence, uh, different types for it. But we haven't detected uh, these particles. We don't know what particles they are, but we know that they can't be normal matter, normal atoms. Uh, they can't interact with uh, the electromagnetic field because otherwise they would be visible. But theoretically, Almost anything, whatever it is, it has to interact with the Higgs field because the Higgs field, by its very nature, interacts with pretty much everything. And that means that if we can produce Higgs particles, as we can produce Higgs particles in experiments, we may be able to use them to produce dark matter particles. So that is the uh, that gives us a way of trying to produce them in the Large Hadron Collider. We haven't been able to do that yet. Also, uh, that means that if, 
it could influence for the behavior of the Higgs field, for example, uh, during the electroweak phase transition. And therefore, because there would, would have been a lot of dark matter around. And um, so therefore this could, for example, uh, explain why the electroweak phase transition works in spite of the Higgs mass not being right. We don't know yet because we haven't found the particles. There's uh, lots of searches, different types of searches uh, for these particles. There's also um, an alternative idea which is more directly connected to the Higgs field, but which is uh, more speculative, is that dark matter may not be elementary particles at all, but black holes. Um, black holes produced during inflation by quantum fluctuations of the Higgs field. It's, under certain conditions, we think that that would happen, but whether it gives you the right number of, uh, of black holes is not clear. But there's a lot of activity in this direction because it's an interesting idea. And um, one reason why it's interesting is that it could explain why uh, LIGO, the gravitational wave uh, observatory, uh, seems to be telling that there are lots of black holes with masses of around 40 solar mass. They've seen a dozen of, of those um, merging. And we didn't expect that kind of black holes to exist because they're too big to be produced in the um, normal way in the, uh, by a collapsing star. And therefore the origin of these black holes is something of a, of a mystery where, where they came from. And so it could be, um, one possible answer could be that they were um, produced in this way by uh, Higgs field during inflation. As I said, this is speculative idea, but this is something that um, people are working on. Um, so obviously all of these things I've mentioned are things where the Higgs field has the potential of explaining something, but we don't have either enough data or things don't quite match. So we need more information, we need more data. And that data can come from different sources. And in fact, in the future, we will be getting a lot more data. We will be learning more about the Higgs field and about cosmology and putting them together will hopefully allow us to give more definite answers. We will get more data from the LHC when it's upgraded with higher energies, higher luminosity, get more better data, better measurements of the Higgs properties. But also, um, one thing is, is very exciting uh, in my view is there's a, uh, a plan to have um, a space-based gravitational wave observatory called LISA by the European Space Agency. And the launch date for that is um, scheduled to be in 15, 20 years time. And it consists of three spacecraft, which are two million, oops, uh, two, two million um, kilometers from each other in space. It's absolutely massive experiment. But that means that it can detect gravitational waves with an extremely high sensitivity. And it can detect gravitational waves coming from the early universe, from the Big Bang. And so that will hopefully give us a direct way of testing this theory in 20, 30 years time. Okay, um, now as the final thing, I wanted to say something about the fate of the universe. I said, told you that the Higgs field will also uh, maybe tell us something about that. And it's to do with the uh, plot that I showed at the beginning. So let's go back to that. So if you look very carefully, so when you look at it quickly, it seems that uh, this interaction strength just goes to zero at high energies. But if you look carefully, you can see that it goes slightly below it, which means that actually the Higgs interaction becomes attractive. And that leads to the potential of 
uh, vacuum instability. And um, what that really means is that I had the Mexican hat potential here. That shows how the Higgs field, how the potential of the Higgs field looks like at, at small field values. Here is just a cross section of that in a, um, and the bump here is the central bump. But um, because the interaction becomes negative, what that tells us is that the sort of a brim of the hat here, when you follow it far enough, it actually turns down and goes negative. And that means that this is actually where we are now is actually, if that's true, then this is not the, the real ground state. It's not the real uh, minimum energy state. The real ground state is here. And in that case, quantum mechanics tells us that um, eventually there will be quantum tunneling. Um, the field will tunnel through that barrier to the true vacuum state. That's an extremely slow process. I mean, I told you that um, a decay of proton was a quantum tunneling process, and uh, that's very, very slow. We've never seen that happening. This is huge amount slower because the barrier here is a very, very high barrier. So this is not something that we should worry about happening soon in our lifetime or even in the lifetime of the solar system. But eventually, if you wait for an infinite amount of time, the theory says that this will happen. It's inevitable in quantum theory. If the theory is correct and if the measurements are correct, that the potential really turns down like this, then eventually the Higgs field will tunnel through this barrier to this side and then roll down. The way that looks, if that happens, is that you get a bubble, a vacuum bubble, where actually inside you have negative vacuum energy, which means that space collapses to a singularity. Therefore, there isn't really any space inside. So this bubble is the edge of space. There's nothing. They, they, it doesn't have an interior. But from outside, it looks like a bubble. And actually, it looks like a bubble that's growing because the, wall, the bubble wall is accelerating outwards. And so very soon, it will uh, move practically at the speed of light. And then you will have a bubble that is growing at the speed of light, destroying everything in its way. And that's, if the theory and data is correct, is how the universe will end. And that's where my talk ends as well. Thank you. Marvellous. Thank you, Artu. I hope uh, not too many of the audience have nightmares about the expanding <laughs> bubble <laughs> that's coming to get us. Now then, thank you for that. That was super. Um, now, we, um, I'm going to start my video for no particular reason. There we are. Um, now, we, we, um, we have a number of questions that members of the audience have um, uh, typed in. Can, can you see those R2 or am I the only one who can see them? If you click um, on the chat button. Because I- Yes, I to... yeah, I can see them. Well, can um, I, shall I read the first one and then from then on, maybe you'd just like to say what they are okay. and go down them and see how far we get. Um, so, um, where are we? Those are admin ones. Uh, okay, from Dr. Henry Ford. Uh, Professor Rajanti mentioned the God particle. May I ask what our scientific research is hoping to find? Well, you've pretty much answered that, I think, but is there anything else to add? Uh, that's right, yes. So, so I, think the, I think the term the God particle is, uh, is, is a bit unfortunate one because it may give a strong kind, uh, it may give wrong kinds of impression, but um, as I've sort of tried to try to communicate here, um, it actually is not entirely um, inappropriate term because uh, the particle may be associated with all kinds of things like uh, how all the matter, uh, how the universe um, came 
uh, to be so large. So the origin of the universe, the origin of matter in the universe, and the end of the universe. So actually, those are the kind of things that we often um, would associate with the uh, with the concept of, of God. So oh, in that super. sense, there is right. A okay. Let's press on to the next question then, if I may. Um, um, let me see. For, oh yes, a question from Martin Keats, one of our members, I think. Um, our two thoughts on whether there was a Big Bang before the last one, and as Sir Roger Penrose asserts, there will, might be another one in a few billion years' time. Um, yes, so this is, um, so in some sense, we don't know. Um, what we can only observe is, um, we, we can see that there was this period of inflation, um, but we can only observe the last moments of, of inflation, and we don't really have any, even in principle, um, any way of seeing what happened before that. Yeah. Therefore, it's all speculative. Now, of course, there, are, there may be theoretical reasons to favor, favor that kind of ideas, and maybe when we have better understanding of the theory, maybe one day we can test those, but, but currently uh, that the sort of what happened before inflation is uh, is something which we don't have any direct way of testing those ideas. Right. Um, about future um, future big banks, the uh, the scenario I presented here for the for the end of the universe would not allow any new any any subsequent big bang. Um, there are other so, so of course, this is this is based on the assumption that uh, there's nothing else than the standard model and gravity, and some possibly minimal minimal changes. Um, however, there are other theories uh, where you have more ingredients which uh, which can change that. Uh, so we certainly can't can't rule that out, and uh, there are lots of theories that would predict that kind of. Uh, okay, so we can all sleep uh, calmly in our beds at night tonight at least. Okay, let me move on then. Um, we have another question from Dr. Henry Ford, which, quickly, which is, which particle is responsible for quantum entanglement? Sorry, I don't see that here. So, so can you say that in which part of... Which particle is responsible for quantum entanglement? All of them. Uh, so so quantum entanglement is is something which uh, is a sort of intrinsic property of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. So all of the different types of particles are really we call them particles because that gives us uh, this kind of uh, um, intuitive uh, everyday uh, picture of them. But really they are quantum mechanical uh, objects, quantum fields, and they all all uh, experience entanglement. Okay, okay, thank you. Right, now then, here's another local one uh, about a colleague, of, which mentions a colleague of yours who, who's previously spoken to us, Claudia de Ram, and the question is from Vince Harris, who says, do you think that de Ram, also from Imperial, is on the right track to explain away dark matter? Um, I, so certainly that's, that's possible, and um, and you and might yes. just mention what it is she has proposed. So, so Claudia de Rob, uh, her her big theory is uh, she found a way to uh, to make gravity massive, and it's um, actually something which was thought to be um, theoretically inconsistent. So that is a that is um, really as a sort of theoretical um, achievement, quite remarkable. And it has all kinds of uh, uh, important, if, if that's true, if that really describes nature uh, and gravity in nature, then it has all kinds of important implications and it could potentially indeed um, explain uh, dark matter and dark energy. Um, what I think is certainly, I mean, I think the simplest explanation for dark matter is that it's just some other particle. We've got quite a lot of particles and uh, and um, they could be one more and that's that's dark uh, matter. But uh, but certainly it could be something more exotic. And I also think that um, 
what her work has 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 opened up is this possibility that gravity has a mass, and therefore it then becomes important to uh, to measure it and study its properties. So we will, I mean, one 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 day we will know, and um, certainly I think it would be would be an exciting um, exciting way of explaining that uh, puzzle. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from Paul Shah who said, I didn't quite understand your comment on strong gravitational coupling. Are you saying the Higgs boson responds to, the gr to gravity differently to its mass? And is that consistent with relativity? Yes, it does. And it is consistent with, rel uh, with relativity. So I think that that's because it is a scalar, a scalar field. Um, mm. For both matter particles and for vector particles, uh, the behavior of the particle in the gravitational field or in curved space time, which is really in general relativity, how gravity is described, it's uniquely determined. Whereas for scalar fields, it's not. And there is a number, there's a parameter which needs to be measured and which hasn't been done. And that's perfectly compatible with general relativity. It's just that um, it's general relativity which tells us that the number is there and needs to be measured. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, what I think, a comment, I think, from uh, one of my colleagues uh, on the Committee of Friends, uh, Rita Leake, who says, for a novel about the collapse of the vacuum, um, read Schilt's Ladder by Greg Egan. So uh, we're yes, smiling I'm on the end. And I would, I would second that. It's a fantastically good book, yes. Um, oh, you've read that. If, if, if you haven't read it, please do. It's good. I haven't seen that. OK. Um, another one from uh, Friends Events. I think someone who hasn't put their name in uh, here correctly. Um, once we have discussed the questions raised in the chat, we may have time to get who has invited audio, both of them. If you wish to unmute and start your video, please raise your hand, which you can find in the Zoom panel to people. OK. Let's just press on the, through the through the typed questions. Um, from David to everyone, um, does the Higgs boson give any indication as to how quasars function? Um, I have to say I'm not an expert on quasars, um, but I think I think not. So all of the uh, this kind of conventional um, astroph astrophysics happens at uh, a lot lower energies. So the only place where potentially you could you could imagine that there's um, there's some relevance, I think, would be. I was going to say black holes, but even even no, uh, even with even with normal astrophysical black holes, the kind of kind of black holes we um, we can observe um, with, uh, for example, gravitational waves, mm. uh, the energies are far too low. For the Higgs field uh, to to have any any significance, they can potentially have if I had a very small uh, a black hole, and that's the only kind of uh, astro astronomical object which um, um, for 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 which the the Higgs Higgs boson can be important, but those we can't observe in any way. And don't they evaporate fairly quickly in any case? Uh, it depends on the, the size. So the interesting size, from the perspective of the of the Higgs field, is around one gram. If they are um, so, and and of course uh, the, um, the 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 kind of black holes that we've seen with LIGO are 20, 40 solar masses. So one gram is a yeah. very very small one, yeah. but it's still uh, much bigger than um, than the sort of really microscopic one. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, those would be um, really at the scale of of the of the Planck mass, and if if if, if you have a black hole which is of that size, then it evaporates very quickly. Mm -hmm. But a gram a gram sized black hole would uh, have a lifetime. It would exist for the whole history of the universe, oh, and um, it's just, and they could exist, and they could actually be dark matter, and we just have no way of uh, of of observing them because they are so small. Okay, thank you. Um, we're coming to the bottom of the list. Um, um, another question from Shrey to everyone. Is there anything else in the theory that could point to the strong gravitational coupling of the Higgs boson needed for the inflaton 
to actually be the Higgs field? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question, and that's something which I've I've been um, at, uh, trying to trying to find in my my research. Find um, other possible consequences of this gravitational coupling. And what I was saying about the black holes is uh, was actually um, very much in reference to that. So sadly, um, there's nothing really in the universe where um, gravitational fields are strong enough. Uh, Current, in the current universe, uh, strong enough uh, for this coupling to be observable, unless we can find this kind of small black holes. Mm -hmm. However, in the early universe, um, uh, there may have been other things, and especially um, with the gravitational wave uh, observations in the future, I think it may be possible to uh, to to. To get a measurement in some sense of this coupling, so I think that's uh, that's probably the most uh, promising way of trying to measure its value is is um, in the early universe using gravitational waves. Okay, thank you. And there's more to come on that, as you mentioned, with uh, Lisa in uh, some years' time. Exactly. Um, from Linda, can magnetic monopoles exist in standard theory? Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's another of my uh, my own research topics, um, yeah. and and yes, so the standard model itself does not predict uh, their existence, but it is perfectly compatible with their existence. So there's uh, there's no uh, there's nothing that um, tells us that they can't exist, and in fact, um, there are lots of theories, grand unified theories, which would unify all the three. Um, fundamental forces, they in fact all predict the existence of magnetic monopoles. Mm. So um, this, um, they, if the question is just can they exist in standard theory, they can in the sense that um, they are perfectly compatible with it, mm. but not in the sense that the theory would require their existence. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we've got to the bottom of the list, but if I may, can I try a question um, about dark matter? Um, is there any reason to assume that dark matter, which responds only to, to gravity, um, should be either homogeneous or inhomogeneous in the university of, in the universe as a whole? We postulate that it exists inside galaxies, don't don't we, to explain why they don't fly apart because they have hypothecated extra mass that is dark and we can't see it, and so they can be spinning faster. Than, than, than expected? Um, or do we expect that um, dark matter should clump like much like ordinary matter does and have its own little clumps which might be, look like galaxies? Yes, so it is the latter. There's a, there's, there's a lot of uh, observational evidence for clumping of dark matter. And um, in fact, because it is, so most of the mass in, in, um, in galaxies is is dark. So actually, that's how, that's what uh, determines where the galaxies form. It really is around dark matter, and um, and we can. There are now ways, especially gravitational lensing, which is looking at how how yeah. um, how light bends um, because of the gravitational field. We can we can tell uh, how the what's the shape of the dark matter distribution in a galaxy is. And um, so we've got a, a, a very good idea of this. Uh, what it, um, it, so it clumps on large scales, but because it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't interact, mm. it doesn't have uh, this kind of microscopic processes that ordinary matter have, which are important for obviously for producing things like stars and this kind of um, um, smaller scale objects. And as a result of that, the dark matter, so for example, in the Milky Way, which has um, this kind of spiral structure, the mm. dark matter distribution on that scale is much more uniform. And it's more like a ball of dark matter, uh, whereas it's only the ordinary matter that forms the spiral structure. So on smaller scales, it has less structure because of that. So do we expect then that 
dark matter in, in a galaxy such as ours might actually be attracted to the central black hole, especially where that hole is many millions of solar masses. Yes, yeah, that's right. So it is, and, and of course, the, um, uh, the most of the mass of the galaxies in the dark matter rather than the, in the cent central uh, a black hole, but still, if there's a black hole at the center, in some sense, that's what the galaxy really is. It's the black hole and the cloud of dark matter around it. And then on top of that, there's a little bit of, of visible matter which makes up all the stars and which is the visible thing and the spiral structure. But really, from the perspective of the of the uh, of the sort of actual mass distribution, it's the it's the dark matter uh, cloud that is the actual galaxy. Mm 